On today's show, we met Jalen Tyson at his introductory press conference. Myself and Spencer Davies will tell you what we thought of the newest member of the Cleveland Cavaliers. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked on Cavs your first listen every day. You can find the show wherever you get podcasts. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, everywhere else. Be sure to leave a five-star review. Leave some kind words in the comments as well. You can really help the show grow by doing that. You can also find the show on YouTube. Search the Locked on Cavs channel. If you're watching us on YouTube, like this video. Subscribe to the Locked on Cavs channel. Leave a comment below as well with what you think of the Cavs selecting Jalen Tyson with number 20 overall i'll pick in the first round of this draft today's show is brought to you by game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms do apply i'm danny cunningham you might know me for my time covering the cleveland cavaliers at places like right here at locked on Cavs, 92.3 the fan cleveland magazine or anywhere else that i've worked over the years joined today by Cavs insiders own spencer davies we uh earlier today spencer you and I both met Jalen uh, Tyson, the Cavs' number 20 overall pick. He had a what I thought was a very endearing and engaging press conference as he met with the Cleveland media for the first time. What were your initial thoughts on, uh, on Tyson? Well, you know, like you said, he definitely had a charm about him. I think that there's also this uh, innate confidence that I think uh, it, it should really make Cavs fans happy just because he was talking about winning championship in his first year. He was talking about winning rookie of the year, being on all defense. That's not that's not light talk for somebody who was picked 20th overall in an NBA draft. That's outside of the lottery guy. That's somebody who's coming in that literally feels like he has nothing to lose. And I, I think that that's really something that sticks out about him. And if the Cavs were sold on the way that he performed in a draft workout and outshined some other guys that were drafted before him, then that should tell you all you need to know. Yeah, and I thought, you know, I, I thought he was very insightful, particularly in, you know, when you're meeting with guys that are drafted in the first round uh, for the very first time, you don't know what you're going to get. Not all of these guys are often trained in the arts of dealing with the media. It can be a little bit more raw. It can be a little bit more emotional as this is, you know, for most of these guys, the biggest moment of their life. Um, and, and with Jalen, I thought he was really insightful. I thought he was refreshingly honest and I thought he was willing to be open with who he is. And that's something that I really did appreciate. Um, the comments you mentioned wanting to win a championship in the first year, like that's just trying to shoot up the gets us meter. Like that is such a, an easy high score day one, um, mentioning wanting to be on an all defense team. But I thought Spencer it was really cool how he was willing and he didn't want to dive in too deep, I didn't think, but he was willing to talk about some of the lows that he's had and the journey that he's been on from, you know, starting out at Texas, going to Texas Tech, ending up at Cal to last night being drafted in the first round. I thought that was a really cool part about this as we start to get to know him a little bit. Yeah, and there's reasons for that too. And Kobe Altman kind of re referred to this as, you know, this is kind of the norm. You're going to see a bunch of guys in the second round who were getting taken, who were, went to multiple schools, maybe not, you know, one each different year. But uh, in Jalen Tyson's case, if you really dig into it, the reason he went to Texas is because he followed Chris Beard. So Chris Beard was coaching at Texas Tech. Initially, he was committed to Texas Tech. Then he de decommitted and went to Texas. And the, <laughs> the, the situation didn't pan out the way he wanted to. So no. he ended up going back to the school he originally committed to in Texas Tech. And even though he had a good year there, he was doing a lot of the off-ball stuff that Mike Ganzi and Kobe Altman were talking about in, in, as far as fitting in, um, doing the cutting, doing the catch shooting, uh, and not playing with the ball in his hand as much. There was an off-the-court uh, racial component with his coach that didn't put his coach in the best of lights. And so he decided to transfer another time. And this time, he ended up in the hands of Mark Madsen, somebody who's very well-respected around NBA circles, who's won a championship with the Lakers, who's been there as a player and a coach and had his own chance to, to start his program at Cal, a, a program that's desperately needed some, some rebooting. Um, and uh, the way that he was able to work with Jalen Tyson this year, saying that these sets are going to prepare you for the next level. The, the way we're coaching you is going to prepare you to be a pro. And the best part about this, I think 
is that Jalen is just kind of ready for the next chapter just because he's learning from these guys and, and somebody that I'm sure we'll get to because of a moment that we had in the press conference about Al Harrington. But yes, he's, he's I'm going to ask about that. I'm going he to is, talk about that. <laughs> he, is, he is respected by that, that next tier that the guys that we grew up watching, honestly. So that's a, a really good sign for him. And I, I think uh, should serve well for him being ready for this. So I want to talk a little bit more about the Mark Madsen aspect about it. And I was going to save yeah. this for a little bit later in the segment, but I have to bring up um, your moment that you shared today with Jalen Tyson, where you asked what was, you know, I thought a, a good question. Um, Jalen has a relationship with Al Harrington. He is someone who uh, leans on Al quite a bit. He looks up to Al as a mentor. So you asked him uh, about what that relationship was like. And Jalen, I don't know if he was expecting a question about Al, but he acted as if he misheard you at first, that like he didn't hear you say Al Harrington. And then you clarified, you know, oh no, Al Harrington. And he goes, who is that? And then took a really pregnant pause and then let everyone else in on the joke that he was just trying to to screw with you a little bit. That was oh, yeah. honestly my favorite part of the press conference because it's funny to see something like that happen to you and we're friends. So I do feel like I can say that. But it was, I thought, it brought out his sense of humor a little bit. Um, and the fact that it might have embarrassed you a little bit too, I, I just, it made me laugh. Uh, you know, it made a lot of people laugh. There were people in the building, whether it was media, front office people that were joking about it after it. So whatever. But uh, he got me. He got me good. I will say that. Um, he did. <laughs> I, was, I was standing there like, I know I did research on this. I know this isn't the wrong person <laughs> I'm asking this about. So, uh, but no, it, I think that is a moment there that I think, one, you know, introduces us to his personality, that he's, he's very easygoing. He's somebody who's conversational. I mean, sheesh, can you remember the last rookie that was that talkative that came into a Cavs, you know, Cleveland Clinic courts and, and talked like that? Like, I mean, not even rookies, very, but like, you know, yeah. Spencer, I've been around guys that second year, even into their third year that are not that. And listen, you and I are not expecting every player all the time to be enthusiastic to meet with the media. Like, that's not what this is. Um, but the I, I think what we're both trying to get at is the presence that he had about himself while holding a microphone. Like, that's not often an easy thing for someone that's in their early 20s to be doing. He had a lot of good one-liners, too, man. He was talking he about how he had to get a new number because George Niang hit him up 10 minutes after he got drafted and got to switch that up. And it, it's it just, again, it kind of just gives you that behind-the-scenes look into who this guy is. And uh, yeah. it's somebody who's, who's, you know, he's using humor. And, but but he was very real about how many lows he's had in his life, and that's a you know a good thing to kind of to have a crutch to to be able to do that. And you can't get lower than low is one of his quotes. And I was like, wow, that was that was really deep. But the way that that he kind of presents himself and isn't afraid to fail, I think if you're if you're putting that stuff out about you, that's not Kobe saying that. That's not Gansey. That's not fans talking about. I want rookie of the year. I want to be on all defense. I want to do all of these things in my first season. I want to win a championship. That's just oozing confidence. And I think that's that's a big part of who Jalen Tyson is. And we learned a lot more about him today in, in that respect. Yeah, and the, the last thing I want to touch on about his experience at Cal, um, aside from the actual basketball things he, he does, which we'll talk about in segment two, he spoke really, really highly about Mark Madsen. Um, you mentioned him earlier, former NBA player, uh, guy that I believe won a title with the Lakers, has been on NBA coaching staffs, the head coach at Cal. He, he spoke so highly of Mad Dog as somebody that has been so influential. And really, you know, there was the one question – I believe it was Terry Pluto who asked him, you know, where, what did you think about where your career was a year ago? And he jokingly, again, he used a little bit of humor here, but he said, you know, it was in Mark Madsen's hands. Um, so I do think that's a really good sign that he was able to trust in a coach like that. Yeah. And I think one of the cooler quotes was, was what came after that it was like, you know, I knew I was ready for a breakout year, but it's one thing to know it. And it's one thing to show it. And uh, it's clear that when he had the ball in his hands and he was playing around guys that were walk-ons, guys who didn't really have too much experience, didn't have too much of the talent, the raw talent that Jalen Tyson possesses. And the usage was high, but he went out there, scored 20 a game, somebody who was not afraid to attack, not afraid to play make, um, you know, shot the ball. 
that's not going to be his role here. We know that. You've asked that, too, in, in the press conference yesterday and today about what his role is going to be like around all-star talent and, 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 and pros. You're not going to be coming in there and getting 30% usage off the bat. You're probably going to get more like a 12% usage um, around the talent that's up here. But how do you adjust to that? How do you do that well? And I think the film from Texas Tech is really what's what sold the Cavs on that because, again, the, the catch-shoot percentage, the, the cutting when he didn't have the ball in his hands, something that we know watching Kenny Atkinson teams, that's what they do. Yeah, I want to talk about his game, um, what he looks like on the floor, how that translates to the Cavs. We're going to do that next right here on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball. And of course, that makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually tend to go down the closer you get to first pitch. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, which is something that I think is very important when you're selecting a ticket that you want to buy. Game Time will show you what that view of the field, court, rink, whatever you're looking for is going to look like from where you will be sitting. And of course, the lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. I actually went to a Guardians game last week, last Thursday. They took on the Seattle Mariners, a daytime affair. Guardians were playing great. I'm like, you know what? I want to go watch the local nine today. So what do I do? Pick up my phone, fire up the Game Time app, find great seats for a great deal, able to check out what my view of the field is going to look like. Because when Stephen Kwan hits a single in the first inning to move to 400 batting average, I want to make sure I've got a great view of it. And Game Time helped me to do all of that. So take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, Spencer, I did ask about this last night because I am curious from a basketball standpoint what Jalen Tyson is going to look like on the Cavs. Um, I don't think a lot of the stuff from Cal is going to translate just in terms of his role. It doesn't mean the skill set doesn't translate. But when he was at Cal, he was, you know, Mike Ganzi, Cavs GM, mentioned it, that he was essentially playing point guard, that there wasn't a, talent, a ton of talent around him. I think he's going to look like a drastically different player, but I think some of the skills that he has, particularly the shooting and the cutting, are things that can be accentuated by playing off the ball, even if that's going to take some time for an adjustment. Yeah, and what do the Cavs have? They have a bunch of guys who are selfless. They have guys that are going to share the rock. Um, you know, Darius Garland, mind you, this is what we're talking about currently, current iteration of the Cavs. We don't know what's going to happen right. with the offseason. We know Donovan Mitchell's extension – um, is probably on the horizon, and then we'll figure out what happens from there. But And for the record, yeah. before you go any further, it is 445 on Thursday as we record this. So if something happens, because I was recording an episode the other night, and then Mikhail Bridges got traded like three hours afterwards. <laughs> so it is 445 on Thursday as we're talking right now. So if something happens in the second round that certainly impacts this, or a blockbuster trade happens, we will have reaction, but this episode does not contain that sort of stuff. Great disclaimer. But no, they Thank have a bunch you. of selfless guys. They have a bunch of selfless guys, and, and like you said, what he can do without the ball in his hands is what's going to get him on the floor. And uh, I think uh, a lot more of uh, what he's able to do too, from from who I talked to last night after the draft, is when he catches the ball in his hands, he's really good at making making decisions quickly. Um, so he can he can play make off the catch, he can attack off the catch, and uh, somebody that is not going to be afraid again, afraid not afraid to fail. And um, that's, I think, some a sticking point uh, for a lot of the, the front office here. Right. And I, I do think in dissecting his game, you know, while he was at Cal, he was he's taking a lot of shots that he's not going to be taking with the Cavs. Like a steady diet for him offensively ended up being mid-range jumpers. Pull-ups. And yep. yeah, I just I don't see that as being part of his NBA game. No, maybe he develops into that. But right away, as a rookie, as a 20th overall pick on a team that had home court advantage and won a playoff series last year, that at the very least is going to be bringing back an all-star guard. Um, maybe it's two all-star guards, but it's at the, I'm pretty confident in saying at the very least there's going to be one of them on the team. With that being the setup in the backcourt, I don't see that as being part of his game. And I mentioned that online, and, and people 
said, oh, so does that mean, you know, all these shots that Donovan Mitchell takes are bad shot be because his diet of shots can turn into that sometimes. And people don't always understand that a shot that's a bad shot for somebody else might be a good shot for another player that's a little bit better. But I think a lot of his opportunities to score the basketball from the perimeter are going to be beyond that three-point arc and in catch-and-shoot situations. And that's a big thing here for me, Spencer, too, because I think his shooting form looks a little bit different. It looks a little bit cleaner when he's in catch-and-shoot spots as opposed to when he's taking um, jumpers off the dribble. So when I was diving into the film myself, uh, I think that you're correct. I think the release is quicker off the dribble than it is when he catch-shoots. When he catch-shoots, the form looks cleaner, but it's slow. Uh, so that's sure. what they really need to work on. I think they need to improve um, maybe the, the apex of the shot. Maybe they need to improve um, just how quickly he gets it up there. And uh, I'm no shot mechanic, but just it's just uh, it's it's something that they're probably going to have to tweak in the development. And that's what Kenny Atkinson really specializes in is player development. So um, that's nice. But it's also nice that they can plug and play somebody like this, because as we know, he's had three years of college experience. So. It's not like he's coming in and he's a, you know, a fresh 18 year old that's just, you know, needs needs developing his project. This is somebody who probably could play rotational minutes if he cracks rotation and, and earns it. Yeah, I, I, I do not disagree whatsoever with that. The other thing offensively I want to touch on before we flip to defense while he's not going to be in a role that even remotely resembles the role he had at Cal, where he had to carry the team, where he had to be the primary creator, where he had to do all these things, I do think the fact that he has experience in that aspect of things will help him, even as he's playing off the ball, because I think he can be a sort of secondary creator, and the fact that he makes those decisions relatively quickly and can pass a little bit, like there are some passes on his highlight tape that are pretty impressive passes. It's not saying, you know, he's the next Chris Paul, but there are some passes that you look at, okay, I can see how you, maybe maybe you shouldn't be initiating offense at the NBA, but you can be someone that is helping to set up others if what you've been set up with isn't quite there. He's not going to turn into a black hole offensively. Right, and I think that instinctually that's going to be the adjustment for him because when you're coming from Cal, when you have that 30-plus usage and you were the guy the whole time, uh, you are going to have a mindset to attack in this case now that you're up here again playing with with four other guys on the floor who probably are going to be more aggressive be more of the scoring types you're going to have to learn how to reverse the ball when you get the the second pass or the first pass on the, on the first possession um you're going to have to learn how to to work in pick and rolls as the screener you're gonna have to learn you know how to to pass out of the short roll and whatever ways because the, the Cavs I know this is a new coaching staff, but a lot of the new wave in the NBA is guard screening. So I'm sure he'll be used in screening actions and stuff like that. Uh, I think that he's going to have uh, an opportunity to showcase some different sides of his game that we didn't see at Cal and might have seen it, at, again, at Texas Tech from what I was told that he did a lot of the off-ball stuff there. So um, probably more or less like that. Um, we know that you know he's a ball hawk. He's somebody that'll will go after the offensive glass. He needs to improve, obviously, on the defensive glass, on defense in general, and maybe add some pounds. Um, but uh, yeah, he's you know six 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 seven. Uh, going to be able to play one through three and in a pinch maybe four, depending on what kind of lineups that Kenny Atkinson wants to put out there. But uh, I don't know why we didn't touch on the point. What's he measure without shoes? Because that's really important. We're going to see him. On oh my the floor god! Not wearing shoes, so you know he's six five only. So goodness gracious. I, I I was actually going to bring that up. Like, that was the next thing I had on my plate. Um, I'm so annoyed by that talk. Like, he's six five and a half without shoes. Okay, great. How many games is he going to play without shoes on? How many possessions in his entire career is Jalen Tyson going to play without wearing shoes in the NBA? Please, I'll take, I'll take let me shoe, know. Because maybe his shoe, maybe his shoe, one shoe will fall off and he'll be down to here and like he'll have like like. And you think that'll happen four times and equal two possessions total? <laughs> exactly. Like it's amazing. Like what it's are we doing? What people come up with it. It really is because I mean, dude, you look you look at even you know Max Struess for example. Like he's definitely capable of, of playing the three, and mm -hmm. he's there's no way he has as much length and and as as tall as Jalen Tyson. There's zero percent. Um. Jalen, for me, like it's because Gansey described him as a bigger guard, and then 
later in that press conference, he referred to him as a bigger wing. So I think that fans might be kind of processing in this. They're like, oh, my gosh, we drafted another Okoro. I'm like, dude, the, the play type is completely different than Isaac Okoro, first of all. Like, Isaac was very raw offensively when he was coming out of Auburn. This guy, he had to pretty much carry an entire team on his back last year. So let's stop with that kind of player comp. What I was told when I was talking to people who, who were close with, with Jalen is that, you know, he's almost got a, a – um, he's not as quite as good of a shooter, but he's almost got a Max Strews type of game. He's almost uh, like what he did last year was Karis Lavernish. Um, I, I know there was someone question in the uh, press conference talking about Caleb Martin, right? Like, like that's the the kind of you know role that that probably suits him um, at the moment, and he's going to have to learn how to grow into that. But yeah, and enough of the the without shoes talk. It, this stuff's so irritating. I don't understand why we even dive into it. It's 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 just it's dribble. <laughs> it is to me, Spencer. It is people that want to be critical of this front office, and like I get it. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be a fan of what Kobe Altman and Mike Ganzi and the rest of that crew have done, and they are by no means perfect. But this is just an opportunity for certain fans to be able to say, "Oh, they drafted another short guy. He's not six six because when he's not wearing shoes, he's six five and a half. Like it is. It's it's ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous. It is. And, it and, truly you know, is. And you know, you know, not to like kind of rain on a parade here, but I think that when you know a big name that that was mentioned that Cavs could have taken was was Tristan De Silva, and he went to Orlando two picks before. Maybe he wasn't the very top of their board, so you know they had to pull this off. And it, from the sounds of it, again, you know, coming in for the the draft workouts really what sold him, and uh, the fact that that he's got that kind of work ethic, it just kind of fits right into what. Kobe and, and Gansey always talk about with just that, that rugged nature and that, that tough guy. Well, he is going to be playing his basketball for Kenny Atkinson. Um, we are expecting that Atkinson will be introduced to the media on Monday. Let's get Spencer's take on the Cavs making a new head coaching hire right after this on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is also brought to you by eBay Motors, passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. A lot of NBA teams are now trying to level themselves up to peak performance as free agency approaches and the draft concludes. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, so much more, whether you're in speed, power style ebay motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you will always find exactly what you're looking for and plus with ebay guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash with the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to make your car the mvp and bring home huge wins keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers so spencer it's been you know almost a week at this point since the Cavs have reported to hire Kenny Atkinson. I don't believe, at least not as of this recording, that the move has actually been announced by the team. Um, I believe the plan, as it's been referenced now in two press conferences, both by Kenzie and by Kobe Altman, I believe the plan is to get to the fan base on Monday um, at a press conference. I'm not sure if it's going to be Cleveland Clinic Courts or Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, but initially when you saw the news come down, what were your thoughts on um, the Cavs hiring Kenny Atkinson? Well, I think that it's definitely somebody that, that has not had a chance to show that he can do it at the next level, at that next tier. I think he got a really raw deal in Brooklyn. The way that that ended with, with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving and the whole DeAndre Jordan starting over Jared Allen thing that, that has constantly been referenced. I think, that I mean, that's, that's kind of full circle now with Jared. And, I mean, and of course we don't know what the roster is going to look like when Kenny Atkinson coaches his first regular season game for the Cavs, but coming to a situation where Jared Allen and Karis LeVert for that matter are currently on the roster is a pretty full circle moment. Yeah. The irony there, isn't it? But it it's is just, it's just, I, I think it's a hire that is player development centric. But it's also a chance for Kenny to, to stick it to Brooklyn, I think, and say, OK, yeah, I can get him there and I can get him to that next tier, that next level. Evan Mobu should be very happy about this hire. Um, Darius Garland, if he sticks around, should be very happy about this hire. 
I just think about the teams that the Nets had when he initially came in. Look at those rosters and saw how competitive they were despite fielding guys that were on 10-day contracts and guys that probably shouldn't have been starting NBA games. When you look at it, it's just some of those rosters from 2016-17 season, you're just like, was that an NBA team? Like, and that's no disrespect to those people because they probably worked their butts off to get there. But just it's the reality of the situation of how talented the uh, other NBA teams were at the time compared to what Kenny Atkinson was working with. But just kind of like the way I described it was, you know, how Terry Francona could got, could get the best out of his guys, even if he had, didn't have the best talent. I feel like that is what Kenny Atkinson does in NBA specific um, niche. And for me, I, I believe that he is going to get the best out of these guys. He is going to, to bring them along, player develop. Maybe we see Evan Mobley stepping out a little bit more as a three-point shooter. Maybe we see Jared Allen stepping out as a three-point shooter. Uh, somebody that I, I referenced, I know you're, you're going to get a point there, but D'Angelo Russell had the best season of his career under this guy. And that was one of the, the all-star seasons that D'Angelo had. If the only all star season he had. Yeah. If if he could do that with DG and get him to shoot nine, ten threes a game, and then in Evan Mobley's case, if you can just get him to be more of a playmaker, more of a downhill um, threat, uh, dribble handoffs, uh, somebody who's not back to basket but but really being active in actions, then you could see these new concepts really come to fruition and maybe that it could work. Um, I, I've been waffling the whole offseason about what they're going to do. But uh, I think it comes down to what Kenny wants. Yeah, I I think that is certainly part of it. I don't think it's entirely what Kenny wants, but I think that's part of the equation. Um, So you and I will have the chance to ask him questions on Monday. The thing that I am most fascinated to ask him in looking at his time in Brooklyn, just from an on-court perspective, and there are certainly other philosophy things or, you know, just his experiences that I'm interested in asking him. But when he was in Brooklyn, those teams always played fast. Three of the four years he was with the Nets, they were top 10 in pace. The fourth year, they were 11th. I'm fascinated if the Cavs are going to now maybe not be a top 10 team in pace, but they've been a bottom five team in pace the last couple of years. So I wonder if they rise up closer to the middle. Spencer, what are the what's the one thing that you're interested to ask Kenny Atkinson on Monday? Uh, just his philosophy as far as the, the motion goes on offense, off ball stuff, um, a lot of cutting, a lot of um, spotting up and Again, like you brought up the pace thing. Can you instill pace into a team that might not necessarily be suited for it? I think that the Cavs are, and they have tried this the last couple of years. J.B. Bickerstaff, make no mistake, he did up the pace and try to get them to make you know move the ball. Uh, but it's just, for me, I want to see how do you kind of tell guys, you thought you were running fast before? Just just wait. Just wait. This is the way that it works, and, and you know, you're going to be, the ball's going to be popping, and I'm interested to see what you know what his de- defensive principles look like. Cavs have amazing individual defenders, but you know, do they keep some of the old concepts around? Uh, you know, there's there's plenty of questions for Kenny. I, I think the first one's going to be like definitely about the Brooklyn stint and how it ended and all that. But um, yeah, I'm I'm interested in his his schematic uh, beliefs and uh, what what he learned maybe from that Golden State three years underneath Steve Kerr. Um, being on a championship team and and uh, he obviously worked under Ty Lue too so he's got some ties here yeah he uh, I think he's got great experience as a head coach in the NBA I'm fascinated to learn more about him I'm, I'm very interested to have the opportunity next week to, to speak with him Spencer very much appreciate you taking the time and doing this today it's been a blast no problem buddy you can find Spencer's work at Cavs Insider of course you can follow him on Twitter at Spin Davies Thank you again for making Locked on Cavs your first listen every day. You can catch the show five days a week. We will have a ton more content coming at you. Kenny Atkinson, free agency begins this weekend. So keep it locked here at Locked on Cavs. Follow the show on YouTube. Like this video if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell. Also subscribe on whatever podcast app you choose. Leave us a five-star review. That is how you can help to grow the show. Thank you for making this your first listen every day.